is fun to be queen sometimes. Mm. One can only imagine. Yorgos Lanthimos's deliciously odd The Favorite throws out all the rules when it comes to the period piece and reinvents the form with a farcical punk spirit. This showcase for three stellar actresses is full of clever, symbolic storytelling and wry observations about our society. But favor is a breeze that shifts direction all the time. Then in an instant, you're back sleeping with a bunch of scabrous whores wondering whose fingers in your Underneath the comedy, The Favorite is a commentary on power. The screenplay was originally titled The Balance of Power. No, take the day off, I command it. Someone must run things. Here, history is just raw material, a jumping off point to explore contemporary and timeless dynamics like how inequality breeds vicious competition. Oh dear. The servant is dressed in the clothes of a lady. And how the intimate, behind-the-scenes relationships of leaders impact the lives of regular people. Well, we should ask people. Get some people in from the villages and ask them. This is not how matters were stated dealt with. People are led. They do not lead. So here's our take on how The Favorite is a sophisticated meditation on power, class, and love. You still that? Yes. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to get notified about all of our new videos. One of the first things you'll notice about the visuals of The Favorite is that it's shot wide. Very wide. Cinematographer Robbie Ryan, who's known for his work with Andrea Arnold, including another period piece that doesn't feel like one, Wuthering Heights, said here that they even used a 6mm fisheye lens, which is about as wide as it gets. The wide view means we're always seeing the characters in their space. Lanthimos said, quote, from the beginning, I had this image of these lonely characters in huge spaces. So the visuals express the loneliness, isolation, and fear of these people at the top of society. And I must be ready, and yet how to be ready when I do not know who my enemy is. We see the characters frequently traversing these long hallways sometimes from the ultra-wide angle, emphasizing that getting around this palace is a long journey, during which the characters are surrounded by an emptiness, and exposed and visible to the court, as if they're on stage. Production designer Fiona Crombie said the movie's color palette came from the black and white marble floor of Hatfield House, the English manor where the film was shot. Three-time Oscar-winning costume designer Sandy Powell dresses the upper-class ladies and the queen in that black and white of the floor. So it feels as if they are part of the palace, merged with this opulent yet terrible environment they can't escape. Ryan elaborated that the claustrophobic effect of seeing the whole room at once makes us feel the characters are imprisoned by this space. Constant camera movement is also central to the visual approach. Lanthimos wanted the camera to always be fluidly moving, almost like a character itself. The film has a lot of whip pans, but whereas a whip pan on most lenses just looks like a blur, as Ryan explained, when you do a whip pan on a very wide lens, quote, you're seeing the whole room move around. So again, through the style of this moving camera, Lanthimos is making us aware of a continuous world pressing in on these characters, allowing them no way out. My life is like a maze. I continually think I've gotten out of it. I need to find another corner right in front of me. The ultra-wide shots also visually support the comedy of the film by making the space look strange, altered, absurd. The lens of absurdity applied to the period drama feels appropriate, because we can only imagine that the lives of these wealthy court aristocrats were absolutely mad. They had little to do with their time but scheme, backstab, and live outrageously decadent lives of luxury. So of course they're going to spend their time on pointless things like obsessing about ducks. Horatio is a prize worth stealing. He does not leave my side. Keep him away from me or I will pull his liver out and eat it with a cornichon and throwing oranges at this guy. Which brings us to one of the subversive strengths of The Favorites, not getting too uptight about period details. This is a film that clothes the low servants in recycled jeans, but The Favorite is probably more true in spirit to what it would have felt like to be part of the inner circle of a royal 18th century court. To live this over-the-top, luxurious, 
sensuous, wild lifestyle. The orange throwing sequence has a brutality to it, so the sequence captures the violence that underpins this frothy, mannered society in which pleasure is derived from hurting and humiliating those who have less. It is important to make new friends, is it not? Yes, if that's what's actually happening here, not veiled threats under the guise of civility. In the costumes, Powell said she cut out a lot of period-appropriate elements but kept the silhouettes and shapes of the time. And that's exactly what the film as a whole is doing, getting rid of historically accurate surface details to zero in on the deeper spirit of the times. There's also an aspect of The Favourite that is playfully revisionist history. It's gender dynamics, the way the film sidelines the men. I apologize, but douche, and I'm thinking. Turning them into puppets and afterthoughts. Congratulations on your wedded bliss. Is a fun kind of wish fulfillment. Case in point, Anne's husband was actually living for most of the time we see, but he's completely left out of the film. While we are generally used to seeing females done up in extensive makeup and hairstyling, here it's the men who look like, as Powell said, quote, ridiculous looking peacocks. What an outfit. Thank you. I thought it might be too much. Your mascara is running. If you'd like to go fix yourself, we can continue this later. She said Lanthimos wanted the women to have a natural, raw look. While here, for once, it's the men who are the background decorations. This wig's ridiculous. A man must look pretty. These women compete through a combination of the stereotypically masculine and feminine. One wears masculine riding gear, plots wars, and loves shooting a phallic gun. Let's shoot something. The other is the image of feminine honey, using mock weakness as a weapon. Still, while it might be tempting to search for messages here about what women in general are like in power, I do not know of women and their feelings, but I know they nurse their hurts like wailing newborns. But often. I feel a surge of desire to see your nose broken. Lanthimos's point isn't that these three people stand for all women. He said, what we tried to do is portray them as human beings. Because of the prevalent male gaze in cinema, women are portrayed as housewives, girlfriends. Our small contribution is we're just trying to show them as complex and wonderful and horrific as they are, like other human beings. The battle between Sarah Churchill, Duchess of Marlborough, and Abigail Hill yields three stunning performances by Olivia Colman, Rachel Weisz, and Emma Stone. We enter this world through Abigail, encouraged to side with the underdog. I hoped I might be employed here by you as something. A monster for the children to play with, perhaps. Yes, if you like. <sighs> and even as she reveals more and more of a cold-blooded, ruthless nature and supplants Sarah as the favorite, we might be tempted to think at least not much has changed, that one tyrannical favorite has replaced another. Do it again! But in fact, Abigail is worse than her predecessor in a significant way. As she tells us, she is only for herself. I'm on my side, always. But Sarah is for a cause. The French are chastened, but not defeated, Harley. We must destroy them. And she serves that cause even when it costs her. There's always a price to pay. I am prepared to pay it. Historically, Sarah's Whig party were against absolute monarchy. They were crucial in establishing constitutional monarchy and expanding the power of the parliament. And likewise, Sarah loves her queen, but she loves her country more. Early on, she tells the queen, If you love me, love has limits. It should not. Then she tells Harley, leader of the Tories, There are limits. To love of your country. To me, there is no limit on that. The queen sees this as disloyalty, as she feels she is the country. She has been unavoidably detained with business of state. That will be here post haste. It's my state. I'm the business of state. And Sarah's downfall is that, in single-mindedly pursuing her strategic vision for the country, she overplays her hand, overestimating her control over the queen. Do not shout at me. I am the queen. And for once, act like one. And forgetting that, at the end of the day, she's still only the favorite, dependent on the queen's favor to retain her power. 
Might I remind you, you're not the queen. Abigail doesn't care how her country is indirectly affected by her machinations. The country's future hangs in the balance. Mm -hmm. My thing is what I wish to talk about. She frequently tells us she's a good person. Even if I were the last one left in this wretched place, I would remain a lady. And delivers delirious monologues about how she doesn't want to sacrifice her morals. I will need to act in a way that meets with the edges of my morality. Yet she decides she can only win this game by playing dirty. When I end up on the street selling my asshole to syphilitic soldiers, steadfast morality will be a f***ing nonsense that will mock me daily. Throughout the film, we get deceptively pretty visuals of Abigail like this. At first, they look like a classically beautiful frame, only to play on and reveal an underlying perversity or manipulation to the situation. And this reflects Abigail herself. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry, your majesty. I think I caught a chill picking the herbs for your leg. The way she appears as the innocent flower. So you are perhaps too kind for your own good. It has been said. But is truly the viper. She is a viper. I think you are a pretty little liar that I have misjudged. In this scene when Abigail dances with the queen, we hear the sounds of the shooting. Signaling to us, while the visuals show sweet fun, Abigail's showing her killer's instinct, making a violent play for Sarah's position. Perfect. I will make a killer of you yet. Meanwhile, Sarah is happy to present herself as cruel and hard. Sometimes a lady likes to have some fun. But in the end, she won't stoop to Abigail's level to win this game. She does almost sacrifice her integrity when she threatens to blackmail the queen with her letters. You have no idea what I would do for my country and for you. But then she immediately burns them, unable to betray her friend and sovereign. Though Sarah apparently loses this battle, we get this enigmatic exchange as she's about to leave the palace. Oh my god, you actually think you have won? Haven't I? We were playing very different games. Abigail may have dominated, but for what? She has no vision, no greater purpose than her own comfort or pleasure. The final imagery as Abigail kneels visually equates Abigail with the bunnies. So this image leaves us with a question. What has she really won? What is it worth to be the queen's favorite, when at the end of the day, you're still just another ridiculous royal pet, vulnerable to the queen's tiniest whim, easily replaced by the next bunny? And in the meantime, you spend your days looking up at this view of a gout-ridden, emotionally disturbed, aging monarch. In history's eyes, if she lost this series of battles, Sarah still won the war, as she came to dominate the narrative of Queen Anne through her harsh writings. And her legacy was carried on through some pretty influential descendants, Winston Churchill and Princess Diana. So embedded in this contest for power, we find a subtle moral that without a larger vision to use our power toward, the victory is empty. In this dancing scene, the way the sound is timed to match the queen's fall tells us something else too. <laughs> that in this shooting competition, the queen is the game. So it foreshadows that Abigail is happy to destroy the queen in order to win. Sarah makes a point of reminding Abigail that the queen isn't just a prize, she's a person. The queen is... An extraordinary person, even if it's not readily apparent. Anne may appear ridiculous as a monarch. I look like a fool. They were all staring, weren't they? I can tell even if I can't see, and I heard the word fat. But as a person, she's incredibly human. As Coleman put it, quote, she sort of feels everything, and her life has been an experience of bottomless grief. I lost some 17 children. This grief is illustrated in Coleman's performance whenever the queen hears music. Stop it! Enough! Stop! Be gone! She can't stand it because the beauty opens up her feeling, and there is just too much hurt and loss there. Some wounds do not close. I have many such. One just walks around with them, and sometimes one can feel them filling with blood. The queen's rabbits represent all the children she's lost. The day's Hildebrand's day. The day you lost him. Yes. 
each one that dies, a little bit of you goes with them. But they also embody her need to substitute relationships for those children she so badly wanted and couldn't have. She passionately needs to feel loved, to mitigate in some small way her unbearable, incurable pain. It hurts. Everything hurts. Everyone leaves me. The worst thing about being the head honcho is that you can't know if anyone is telling you the truth. The queen is tortured by not knowing if anyone loves her, or they all just want something from her. Abigail understands this, so her strategy is based on making sure the queen never feels she wants anything. I do not want her to ever think I want anything from her. I do not wish to know what I've decided. I wish to know that you are happy, and that your spirit will light in once this is done. Meanwhile, Sarah bosses the queen around. You will pronounce the tax in Parliament. I will set the date. Making open demands for her cause. She wants nothing from me, unlike you. She wants nothing from you, and yet somehow she is a lady with 2,000 a year. In this pivotal scene where Sarah makes her final plea, we are placed in the queen's perspective, feeling the tension of not knowing if Sarah is genuine. She does not love you. Because how could anyone? But here, Sarah voices the deepest point of the film, that love is honesty. No, sometimes you look like a badger and you can rely on me to tell you. Why? Because I will not lie, that is love. Sarah may not always be nice. Aim for the flagstones, the lawn might break your fall. But we see her display loving tenderness for Anne, push her out of her funks to make her go do things, and curb her self-destructive habits with tough love. I am not food. You cannot just eat and eat. It is far easier to lie and please than it is to love and be honest. I wish you could love me as she does. You wish me to lie to you? Abigail would offer the queen wine, though it's bad for her. You should have some. I'll get you some. It would ease you. No. While Sarah would rudely deny the queen hot chocolate for her own good. None for the queen. What? What, you cannot have hot chocolate? Your stomach. Eventually, the queen must choose between a woman who presents meanness. You are too sensitive. And you are too mean and uncaring some days. Some days I'm quite lovely, though. Let's think on them and a woman who presents sweetness. Your hair is so lustrous. It's something people in court comment on. One puts her down. You look like a badger. Oh. Are you going to cry? The other flatters her. You're so beautiful. Stop it, I, you mock me. I do not. If I were a man, I would ravish you. In the end, the queen chooses flattery over love, and she's heartbroken the rest of her days. So the tragedy of the final image isn't truly Abigail's, it's the queen's. Sarah wasn't a bunny like the rest, as symbolized by her disgust for the creatures. Sarah, you must say hello to little ones. No. Anne sent away the one person who treated her like a real person and an equal, instead of cowering to her like a trapped, scared rabbit. The queen knows that she gave up her one honest relationship for a lie. The favorite is transplanting something current onto Queen Anne's England to speak about our own time. It's exploring contemporary issues like the way that sexuality factors into relationships between a more powerful and less powerful party, how big state decisions can come down to which private parties have the ear of the leader. Is it a bit like going late to a party? It is not like a party. I'm sorry, Prime Minister, passing thought. I think it is like a party. A perfect analogy. The toxicity of a polarized political environment and the ways that women can find power within a male system. Have you come to seduce me or rape me? I am a gentleman. So rape then. A central commentary we can see in this film is warning about the dangers of inequality. You have fallen far. As Ryan observed, life was so polarized, the poverty was extreme, and the rich was extreme. You can say that about nowadays, but I don't think it's even touching the levels of what society had back then. Even though they're related, an important class difference separates Sarah and Abigail. In a way, Sarah's freedom to fight for a cause is a luxury born of her life of privilege. Abigail's traumatic past means she feels she can't afford to worry about more than herself. Her first-hand experience of how the world treats its poor and its nobodies. Oh. 
means she'll do anything to feel secure and comfortable. You are of a sweet disposition and have suffered blows, so desire safety and favor above all else. Look how happy she is when she gets her own room. She's fueled by a desperation not to end up back out on the streets. I must take control of my circumstance. No matter how powerful Abigail gets, I have won. I am safe. She never truly feels safe. Now that she's gone, I find myself more concerned than when she was here. When Abigail comes into this environment, she perhaps is the sweet-hearted lady she keeps claiming to be. I am a person of honor, even if my station is not. I'm still the lady I was. In my heart. She actually seems to surprise herself with the vicious acts she's capable of for self-preservation. As it turns out, I am capable of much unpleasantness. So this character is a warning that, when you have a vastly unequal society, the fear in the lower classes for survival and the fear in the upper classes of losing their status creates savage competition all around. I could not just stand by and let you destroy me. The favorite takes after Stanley Kubrick's Barry Lyndon, in some visual choices like using natural light, which in night scenes meant shooting by candlelight. And on a deeper level, both are stories about opportunists who are hurt in their early life. I was 15, my father lost me in a card game. They climb the social ladder and adopt the hedonistic, lavish lifestyle of their former oppressors, yet their feeling that they don't belong never goes away. On the surface, this looks like just a stunning tableau of a lady from the past. Yet as the camera pushes in, inviting us to look closer, we notice that she is uncomfortable, afraid. She doesn't fit with this backdrop. Images like these express Abigail's insecurity that no matter how high she rises, she'll be called out as an imposter. After Abigail rises in status, Powell said she gave her clothes the vulgarity of the nouveau riche to make her look like she was trying too hard. The mistake these characters make is to imagine that rising up in the ranks will free them. And the biggest idea the favorite leaves us with is that in any grossly unequal social system where ultimate power is concentrated in the hands of a few, all people are trapped. This is encapsulated in the final scene when Abigail crushes one of Anne's pet bunnies under her heel just for the hell of it. And it's no coincidence, by the way, that some of these bunnies are distinctly black and white, looking a lot like the ladies of court. Through her haze of advancing illness, Anne registers disgust at the true nature of this pretender, and she asserts her power to remind Abigail who's boss. How dare you touch the queen like that! Yet, being the boss is no fun either. As we've seen, no one in this film is sadder than the queen. It's a deep, dark truth about human nature that when we can't address or retaliate against the true cause of our frustration, we take it out on somebody who has it worse. Look at me! How dare you! Close your eyes! Incompetent! So what the queen does to Abigail here is the same as what Abigail did to the bunny. The unhappiness trickles down from the top to the bottom of society, as each dissatisfied person cruelly punishes the one beneath her, until everyone is miserable. All I know is, your carriage awaits, and my maid is on her way up with something called a pineapple. Hi guys, it's Susanna. And Deborah, And we are The, the Take. Take. If you like what we're doing and you're new here, please subscribe. And if you have the means and you want to, please consider supporting us on Patreon. And there's also a new feature here on YouTube where you can hit that join button and become a member right here. Thank you so much for watching.